afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Merkel. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at FireEye. For those of you that don't know FireEye, uh, we are an information security software managed solution and product company, uh, off also offer services. And our job is to basically find advanced cyber attacks in many of the organizations that you see in the headlines today and prevent the damage by going from detection to response in minutes. Now, when we thought about this presentation, uh, it was you know, defend against malware, but we want to take it up just one more level to maybe talk about advanced attacks in general. And what we're going to cover is a little bit on the current state of things. You know, what's up with bad guys? What's going on? And then what's our philosophy for how to deal with that problem? It's not a sales pitch. Not going to talk about products today. But we want to talk about the things that drive how we think about the landscape uh, out in the cyber domain. It's such a serious topic that we sent the cyber Willy Wonka to come talk to you today. That's me. I am aware of what I look like. I've got a mirror, so uh, I get that all the time. I uh, didn't want to do this uh, solo, so I brought my partner in crime, Peter Silverman, director of FireEye Labs, with me. Oops. We'll go back. There we go. <laughs> yeah, that's, we'll just keep going. <laughs> this is... just, just go with that? Yeah, just go with that. Way to slide that slide in there, thanks. You know, I wonder if you're fired yet. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, we wanted to talk a, a little bit about bad guys, right? Because the problem today is not just malware. Malware is just a tool. The problem is, is bad guys. And another thing I don't like is hipsters. But the thing about bad guys is really the fact that they've been around forever. Okay? Bad guys are uh, they're not new. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not something that just developed, but since the beginning of the time, since somebody could take a, you know, a mastodon bone and smack somebody on the forehead and take their Bronto burger, there have been bad guys that want to take the stuff that you have uh, and subvert the things that, uh, that you do. And bad guys come in all different kinds of flavors and shapes and sizes. Uh, they will use anything inside of their domain in order to take or hurt something that you have. So if there's uh, you know, a new technology like train tracks, you know, Snidely Whiplash goes and ties up damsels and puts them on the tracks and tries to ransom them. Or uh, you know, if you have the ability to travel through space and subvert new species, you learn that a particular species on SETI Alpha 5, you can stick its larva in Chekhov's ear and turn them into a mindless slave. Right? So every time there is something that is new or different that can be subverted, you have bad guys who have the intent to do that. And in the cyber domain, that's especially true. So think about what's going on today. Everything we do, everything of value, everything that you connect with, that you pay with today, has some kind of online connection, is transacted digitally. Well, why would bad guys not move into that same domain? So what we're witnessing today, I think, is less any kind of rampant storm of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and more a new normal more the current reality of where the spies are going to go and where the criminals are going to go. Where information goes, spies follow. Where money goes, crime follows. Um, I sometimes talk to some audiences about it this way. It, if my son had a lemonade stand, it would be connected to the, to the, uh, the house Wi-Fi. He would run payment systems on his iPad with a square reader. His inventory would be in Google Docs. And there'd be some website somewhere where he concocts and keeps his secret formula. And down the street, little Timmy, whose lemonade stand is not doing as well, would absolutely be targeting that information and trying to get some sort of gain from it. It's that pervasive. And we see the headlines all the time, right? So you've seen the big headlines. You've seen Wall Street Journal articles. You've seen Home Depot, Target, Sony, uh, Anthem, et cetera. It's pervasive. But here's something that you may not actually know. I sometimes like to compare and contrast cyber attacks and shark attacks. So let's think about that for, for just a minute. Shark attacks, how many of them do you know about? All, all of them. Every shark attack generates a headline, every single one. Whether somebody got bit on the toe or somebody got their legs taken off in Sydney, you know, halfway across the world, every shark attack generates a headline. Now let's contrast that with cyber attacks. How many cyber attacks do you know about? And the answer is statistically none. For every headline that you saw up there that I flashed, I know about 50 other organizations that had breaches almost as serious. You know nothing about them. So it is pervasive, and it can impact significantly more organizations 
and is impacting significantly more organizations than just the big brands than you see in the major news media. So the, the key part of this is that this isn't just the, the fortune anything problem. It, it's, a, it's an everyone problem. When, when we think of attackers, they're humans. And so if we draw an analogy to, let's say, robbing a bank, and let's say we wanted to rob that bank and not win a Darwin Award for stupidity, right? So we put some thought into it. We want to be successful, right? That's what we're going for. We might say, hey, I'm going to go steal some cars. I might grab some license plates. I might go in one way and come out the other way with different cars. There'd be some thought, right? The everyone problem affects you because you can be part of the attack or a victim. And either way, it's a problem. So if our attackers take that same mentality, they, they use what we call hops. They're not going to come from home and pop Sony. No, they're going to go through three or four other companies or universities or homes or what makes scale and what makes us be able to stand up infrastructure so fast the flip side is true for bad guys. They can get the boxes they need to jump around by just pushing a button. So they can go through anything to get there. So that's the first part of the problem. Oop, the big red button. Wrong way, sorry. There you go. So we have two things going on. Once they've got their infrastructure and their hops, hop points together, then they need to get to their target or accomplish their mission. And it may be as simple as going straight to the company they want to get into. But sometimes it's easier to attack the perimeter or the periphery of the company. And by that I mean, say this company has a, an external legal counsel that has internal access, or has uh, technological partnerships with companies that have internal access, or is a has a manufacturer relationship that has internal access. Any one of these three Examples, one, they've been true, and two, that might be easier for the attacker to go and target a much smaller company that's less security conscious, doesn't have the security budget, and get in that way. So they don't always have to go straight through the front door. It'd be the equivalent of a bank robber going to the maker of the safe, finding the master key or master combination, taking that with them and going in. It's the same analogy. So in this case, we have a compromise where they might just hop through one point. Once they've gotten in and they've re picked up the data they're interested in, they're going to exit. And they're not going to exit the same way they came in. So they're going to potentially go out through another set of hops that they've stood up that we're unaware of. And it's the same, it goes back to that analogy of leaving in a different car in a different color with a different license plate. Same things are true so that they can mitigate the risk of getting caught. There are four key reasons that, and factors that kind of go into attacker success and why this is going to be an, a forever problem. We're a security vendor coming up here and saying we don't have a magic box. So you might want to tweet that or whatever you guys do with that. We don't have a magic box. We're going to define what the new win looks like. So they have scale. The attackers can scale out. They have the money and then the, the backing to bypass defensive mechanisms. Companies are constantly innovating, so there's more things to steal. Defense is innovating, so there's more, more defensive measures. It's a cat and mouse game. And finally, the attacker's risk is much lower. If they're state-sponsored, they're not, they're not going to get extradited. And your risk is much greater as you innovate and partner and gain more success. So we're going to quickly go through the, the anatomy of attack here. Um, and this is going to go through the different phases of the actual cyber attack. So the first phase is external recon. With external recon, if you think about it, if we went to rob a bank, we'd, know, we'd go and look up the address. We'd have the address of the bank. We might watch the employees coming in and out. We might know their lunch patterns, who they talk to. We might look at social media and say they're interested in these things. We'd gather all that information. It's no different with our attackers. They're going to find your, where your infrastructure lies. They're going to figure out who works for you, who does what for you. As you scale, your attack surface scales, and the uh, ability for them to get in increases. So that's something to think about. After you have your external recon, you have your initial compromise. And we're in a tech-focused group here. So we might think to ourselves, I'm not going to get compromised. I won't fall for one of those phishing emails. I've seen them. They're, really, they're misspelled. There's no way I'm clicking it. But you got to ask yourself this. If you have 30 people in your company, I only need one of them to click a link. Are you willing to bet your whole company's intellectual property on, that I can't convince one person to click a link? 
I, I wouldn't. I might be the person to click the link for all I know. It depends how compelling it is. So you have the initial compromise. Once you have the compromise, they're now in, but they're in on one place. They want to be able to come back because it's going to take some time to find what they need. We've had attackers in places for years. So they're going to establish a foothold so they can revisit. And that's going to be compromising credentials, installing software so they can revisit. Once they're in, they don't know anything about the internal networks. So there's no way for them to have done any recon. So now they're going to do the recon again. Where is what I'm after? What, what am I after? Where is it stored? How do I get it out? Once they have it, you have the final stage, which is theft. This can circle back, and they can keep stealing as you upgrade or build new things. But this is the, the life cycle that we see very commonly. So, so you might ask yourself, well, OK, we've got professional threat actors. The problem is people. Um, it's a forever problem because of the scale that bad guys can achieve through technology, just like innovation helps us, the good guys. It helps the bad guys. The risk profile is awesome. I'm not going to get arrested. I can attack forever. What, what does the solution look like? And by the way, we believe there is no magic box. There's good technology, but that alone won't solve it. So we talk uh, at FireEye about this concept of adaptive defense. And we say there's three things you have to have in order to be effective. You, you do need technology. So if you're still using the same stuff you were using 10 years ago to protect yourself, you're, you're doomed, right? The attacker is not using the same kinds of attacks or exploits, the same tools and methodologies as 10 years ago. They're professional. They're evolving. There's profit in this. So just as they innovate in the way that they will exploit your technology, you must innovate in the technology you deploy to deal with them. But there's two more pillars, right? So I said before, there's no magic box. The technology without these other two items is, is not useful. There's intelligence. The bad guy knows a lot about you. You need to know a lot about the bad guy. Otherwise, you're operating at a strategic disadvantage. And lastly, there's expertise. There's a human element in the loop. Why don't we dig in just a little bit and talk about some of the tech and we'll cover some intel and expertise examples. Cool. So our bad guys like to blend in. So we've gotten to a point with uh, malware and, and attacks that, that the, the old way of doing things that worked 20, 10, five, even five years ago no longer works, right? The way antivirus functions, what they identify, how it works is not suitable when you're talking about the human aspect, the fact that they can adapt. If I said to you, you have a fixed number of characteristics to find someone in a crowd of people, you might be able to do it, you might not. It might be 50-50, it depends how good you are. But then if I said the person you're looking for is Mystique from X-Men, right? Now you're kind of at a real disadvantage because you have no clue what she looks like, regardless of what you can look for. So if you could look for the facial features, then the weight, the height, all these things, that's fine and that works some of the time. But we kind of need to innovate and come up with a new way to de describe and define and find things. And that goes to something besides what it looks like on the outside, and that's behavior. So we have Mystique here in two different forms, and that's going to represent our attacker and what they want to do. Now, if we were just to look for in a crowd, we wouldn't know what we're looking for. But if we took, what, if we took everybody in the crowd and we said, go ahead and behave how you would, no one's watching, right? They kind of review themselves. And what they're revealing is their behavior patterns. They're saying, hey, I'm here to steal this thing. And we can use virtualization and things like that to essentially convince the attacker and their tools that you're in an environment. You're actually executing correctly. Go ahead and behave. Act out. You know, party on. Whatever that might be. And when you do that, you get rid of the disguises. And the behavior is what unifies the uh, attacker and most software. And we can further innovate by using analytics to say, when bad things are happening, they tend to make trends look like this. And these are things that are much harder to obscure for the attacker, because it goes to the exact goal of what they want and not how they look. And that's kind of where we are with the innovation. So if we're using technology that deals with behaviors instead of sort of static descriptions, right? That's sort of what's the new normal now, the new innovation that you've got to put in place. You have to overcome the fact that the attacker can look different every day all the time for free because that's what they've been innovating on. So that's one element is getting technology that helps you de uh, deal with that, virtualization and analysis, data analytics. But we also talked before about intelligence and, and expertise. And, and here's the point we'd like to make about that. Let's, let's think about how attackers act today versus 10 or 20 years ago. 10 or 20 years ago, predominantly what you're looking at is sort of spray and pray attacks. Let me send the same attack 
to dozens of organizations and let me just go ahead and exploit the stupid. Whereas today what happens is attackers go through that process that Peter talked about and they know everything they possibly need to know about your organization. They know what technology you use. They know what your network address space is. They know the people in your organization. They know who works in what department. They know that Bob works in sales. They know what day Bob gets his sales compensation plan, the fact that it comes in an Excel spreadsheet. And oh yeah, Bob buys Fruity Pebbles at Costco on Tuesday because Bob tweets about that crap. They absolutely have that level of intelligence. So if you are not arming yourself with that same information, how can you advise yourself about the organizations that might be targeting you, what investments to make or not make in security? Because you could spend every dollar in your organization on security if you wanted to and actually not be secure. You have to think very, very differently and invest differently because the adversary is a thinking, breathing human being. So the need for that intelligence investment and picking a vendor, a set of vendors that can provide different pictures from different seats in the theater is absolutely critical to informing how you're going to about, go about protecting yourself. You just can't sit back and buy technology and rack and stack boxes. You have to think about the people aspect of the attacker. But that also means you have to think about the people aspect of the defender. So only today does IBM have a stack of silicon that can play chess consistently at the grandmaster level, and even then it's not going to win all the time. And in chess, there's about 10 to the 123rd, give or take, possible realistic games that you can actually get out of the game board. There's more mathematically possible, but they're just, you'd have to kind of throw out the outliers that you could just never get into those positions. 10 to the 123rd. And that's still a big but finite number. And only now do we have silicon that can play at the grandmaster level. Well, think about your information security and IT infrastructure. Do you actually think that you can just put in a magic box and some software and actually outplay a grandmaster from an attack scenario perspective? You can't. So you have to have your own humans in the loop. That means you have to have your own cyber expertise, and you have to get that either by investing in it yourself and making those people more effective with intelligence and technology or getting that from a trusted partner. The bottom line is there's not any magic. It's hard. right? So anybody that wants to come and sell you something that says, oh, you just buy our magic whiz bang, what's it, and we make the problem go away and we prevent everything, is lying to you. It's hard. There isn't any magic way to get to some perfect end game. The other thing you're potentially being lied to about is what the outcome is going to be. Because the outcome isn't you magically make bad guys go away or you prevent everything. The outcome is you potentially achieve resilience, kind of like a honey badger. Right? The realistic outcome is that if a cyber breach occurs in your organization, it's not that you can necessarily prevent it outright, but you can go from detection to response in minutes through the application of technology, intelligence, expertise, and if not preventing the breach outright, prevent its impact. Thank you, everybody, for sharing some of the time with us today. I uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, guys. Thanks.